Jesus is on a road to victory. On this road to victory, we've already learned that Jesus was betrayed. In fact, it's kind of a code setup. Judas trades Jesus in for money. After he makes a deal, Judas meets Jesus and the other disciples, and he sits down and he eats with them. Now, I know you never had anybody that sat at the table with you and shared some food, betray you, talk about you behind your back, or stab you in the back. Jesus is eating with his disciples, and Judas has already betrayed him. We learned that as we move forward in our lives and do the things that God has called him to do, sometimes our journey will come with betrayal. Sometimes the people we love, the people we trust, the people that we let in our circles, sometimes are the very people who betray us. Then we learn that on our journey from the life of, life of Jesus, that sometimes there's going to be a moment just like Jesus where you have to surrender. It, it's, it's not you and your spouse, you and your friend, you and your homeboy, you and your girl. No, it, it is a moment in time with you and God when, when you see the direction he's taking your life, you're going to have a moment of surrender. Pastor, why surrender? Jesus surrendered because he did not want to go through what he was going to have to go through in order to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Sometimes we'll have a moment in time where we have to surrender. If in order to do what God's called you to do, you're going to have to surrender because it may come with something you don't want to have to go through. But we learn sometimes God won't take it from you, but God will pull you through it. Amen? Then we learn, we learn isolation. We learn that as Jesus has now been arrested, and Jesus is now arrested and being taken to the rulers and, 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 and of Rome and the soldiers and the government, we learn that as Jesus is arrested, that Peter has an isolated moment. Peter has a moment of isolation. Peter has a moment where he denies Jesus. In fact, Jesus told him before this would happen that the enemy has asked for you and he wants to sift you, shake up your life, stir up your life to see if after your life has been turned up and down, side to side, if you truly believe what you said you believe. And, and Peter denies Jesus three times. And we learn that in the moments of weakness, when we don't want to represent Jesus, when we don't want to represent Christ, when we don't want to be labeled as a believer, God's love, his mercy, and his grace is available to us. We learned last week, on our journey, it comes with sacrifice. Jesus literally sacrificed his life. They didn't murder him. He said, you're not taking my life. He says, I'm laying it down. And Jesus laid his life down. He was... He was uh, bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. We learned that every time we cross the line, every time we fall short of the glory of God, every time we sin, whatever word you want to use, when we miss it, Jesus was crushed and he was bruised for our iniquities. Then we get today and we learn God's unstoppable power. In fact, Jesus has been betrayed. Jesus has been arrested. He's been lied on. He's been spit on. He's been beaten. He's been humiliated. He's been hung on a cross. And now his body has been thrown into a borrowed tomb because he's dead. And God decides to use a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene to reveal to us God's unstoppable power. In fact, she, she's distraught. She, she's running. She's hurrying to get to the place where Jesus' body is. And the Word of God says, if you read Mark's gospel, you read the other gospels, you read John's gospel in particular, the Word of God says that when she was afar off, she was trying to wrap in her mind how it is 
she was going to roll away the stone from the tomb because she and other women had spices and they wanted to not just uh, prepare the body of Jesus for its final preparation. They wanted to make sure his body was taken care of properly. Now, because Jesus had died um, going into the feasts and the festivals and on the Sabbath, they had to hurry Jesus's burial. And so they got a borrowed tomb. They tried to do the best they possibly could to get Jesus's body laid to rest appropriately. And so these women said, well, let's go to the tomb and let's make sure we make final preparations for a dead body. They wept. They, they were confused. But they wanted to make sure that they took care of Jesus's dead body. And when Mary is a far, far off, she realizes, wait a minute, somebody has rolled the stone away. She sees that the stone has been rolled away, so she figures, she did what you and I would do. Y'all just as nosy as Mary, right? Y'all just, <laughs> I wonder what's going on in there. So she peeks into the tomb, and she realizes not only has the stone been rolled away, but the body of Jesus is missing. Now, if you read all four Gospels, you realize that they came to a conclusion. Somebody took his body. Now, his body was supposed to be guarded, and there were no guards on their post. The stone had been rolled away, and now when we go in the tomb, his body is missing. Where's the body of Jesus? We have spices, and they're expensive. Where's the body of Jesus? Now, uh, uh, one, one version of the Bible says that there was one angel on the head, one on the foot. Another one says that they, they were so distraught that they thought the angel talking to him was a little boy wearing white clothes. And the angel says to him, to, 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 the, to them, the women, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth? He's not here. He is risen. Thought I'd get at least two or three amens on he is risen. You get real Baptist, he is risen indeed. Come on, somebody. And, and so she, they, they get to the place, and then, then, then John, John reveals to us that th she's not celebrating that the body is missing. She's not encouraged at the body being missing. In fact, she is not only distraught, she's confused. Have you, have you ever looked at a situation in life and wondered what in the world is God doing? It, it, it's bad enough that they expected Jesus to overthrow the government. It, it's, 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 it's already bad enough they, they expected him to deliver them from physical oppression. But now the one that they left family for and friends for and supported financially, he's dead. He wasn't supposed to go down like this. I, I feel ashamed. In fact, I feel embarrassed. I put my trust in Jesus for three and a half years, and he's dead. Have you ever put your trust in God and been confused about how things are turning out? Have you ever walked with God, talked with God, prayed with God, look, did the best you could, and your whole world was turned upside down? Now, God, I expected this to work out. but it's not meeting my expectation. <laughs> Stay with me. Have you ever been confused because you lost somebody that you love? Have you ever wrestled with God? Lord, what in the world are you doing? Have you ever struggled, confused at what God was doing because you, your business sunk? Your career was not advancing. You got a bad doctor's report. Lord, you, I'm just trying to do the best I can, doing what you called me to do, and it seems like this doesn't look like anything you said. And she, she gets to the tomb, she's confused. I'm going to tell you, she's so confused that she can't even see God when he's right in front of her. I don't believe him. Let's go to the text. Because Mary's going to teach us that sometimes we cannot see God 
when things don't go the way we expected. Now go to John chapter, chapter 20, verse 11. Verse 11 says this. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. You with me? As she wept, she bent over and looked in the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been laid. One at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord's body away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Watch this. But she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking, watch this, he was a gardener. She asked him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him so I can get him. Jesus said, Mary. She turned and said to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Watch this. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus, walks in the tomb, sees it's empty. Now, the word of God says, the angel says to him, to her, watch this, he is risen. Another, another gospel says, he's risen. This gospel says, why are you crying? They've taken the Lord's body away. Now, then she said, the word of God says that when she's outside of the tomb crying again, Jesus is standing right in front of her, and she can't recognize him. I'm going to rewind the tape. Now, because God didn't meet her expectation, because she was so focused on what she wanted to do in that moment, she was supposed to prepare his body. She was supposed to put spices on his body. She was supposed to make sure he was wrapped properly in linen. She was supposed to prepare the body of Jesus, and she could not see that God was right in front of her. Because God was not meeting her expectation. She couldn't recognize God when he was standing right in front of her. Have you ever struggled to recognize God? When things didn't go the way that you expected? And what's interesting is she says, when Jesus reveals and speaks to her directly, she realizes it's him. But this, this, this is what I wrestle with. Now, when I use my homiletical exegetical imagination, <laughs> I cannot understand how they didn't know it was Jesus. Now, why were those, they so surprised that he got up? Think about that for a minute. Why in the world were they so, so, so surprised that Jesus wasn't laying there? Now, I would suggest to you they forgot what Jesus promised them. That's right. We're in, we're in John chapter 20. What about what John said in, in, in Jesus said in chapter 2? God don't believe in this. Go to chapter 2. Chapter 2 says this in verse 19. Watch this. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. One more time. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Verse 20, they reply, <laughs> it has taken 46 years to build this temple, Jesus, and you think you're going to build it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. <laughs> Stay with me. Now, Jesus already promised he would get up. One more time. Jesus already promised that he would get up. Jesus said, destroy this body, and I promise you I'll, I'll, I'll lift it up. Lie on me, but I promise you I'm getting up. Spit on me, but I promise you I'm getting up. Beat me up, I promise you I'm getting up. 
put a crown of thorns on my head, but I promise you I'm getting up. Put a spear in my side. I promise you I'm getting up. When this dead body goes in that borrowed tomb, I promise you three days later, I will get up with all power in my hand in heaven and on earth so that humanity can have life in me and you can get up because I have all power in my hand. Jesus already told them, and they're surprised that he got up. But this Jesus got up because God's unstoppable power. For like preaching now. They were surprised he got up, but listen to me. He got up because of God's unstoppable power. We're going to close out this series today. He got up because God's power is unstoppable. Y'all don't believe me? Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. I'll bring this home. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 says this. And his incomparable great power. Watch this. For us who believe. You might want to write that in your notes. I got to say it twice. And his incomparable great power for us who believe. Watch this now. Now, because there's something about this, this power. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm. You missed it. Hold on. Whatever this power is that's available to you and I who believe, it is the same power, the same mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead. I got to say it one more time. Hold on. Because this ain't just some regular power just laying on the ground somewhere. No. This power is available to those who believe. Do I have any believers in the house this morning? Because, watch this, whatever this power is, this power is the same power that he exerted to raise Jesus. Y'all, 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 y'all not with me. Now, now, the power is accessible to you or not, but this, this power ain't no regular power. This power had the ability to raise a dead Jesus from the dead. And God says, that's the type of unstoppable power that's available to you and I. Now, pastor, but, but what kind of power is able to do this? You ask great questions on a Sunday morning. Now, the word, the word uh, um, for, for power, he says, it's not just a power, it's incomparable. Another translation said, it's exceedingly great. Another translation said, it, it is surpassing power. Right? It is, it is, it is who... Hupabalo. Now, y'all don't, y'all, hold on. The doctor's in the house. Now, now, when you put these two words together, it, it, it is something that has the ability to go beyond. But, but it also uh, means, watch this now, it means to go beyond and it means to throw, which means what, whatever limit you placed on this power, whatever limits were placed on your life, Whatever limits were placed on your dreams, whatever limits were placed on them, watch this now, it has not met its match, and its match is God's unstoppable, incomparable power. Let me see if I can help you out now. In, in the Olympics, they have certain competitions, and, 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 and uh, you, you, you win as a competitor based on the distance. Now, one of them is a shot put, right? And in the shot put, you know, you, you, you throw something as far as you possibly can. But watch this now. Man, humanity, humans have already predetermined how far they think you can throw. So they make parameters around what they think your ability is. So when you throw, it will land within the measuring lines. Y'all didn't like that one, let me see. Y'all, what about the long jump? Y'all like the long jump, right? Right? I didn't want to tear my Achilles, y'all, I'm just. <laughs> yeah, so he said, don't do it, Pastor. Don't do it. 
But in, in the long jump, they, they, they measure out and they already predetermined based on their, the distance of the sand how far they think you can go. Now, the problem with this is that's not this type of power. Now, when God says it is incomparable, exceeding, surpassing power that is available to those who believe, it, it, is, it means a power that goes beyond the guidelines. It, it means that when, when they put limits on what they think you can do, they made these limits based on what you had the ability to do, what I have the ability to do, what your neighbor has the ability to do. They did not fathom in their mind or calculate that God has an ability he can place in you to make you go further than the measurements that they already placed. I came to tell somebody today that I don't know what measurements, what parameters, what barriers have been placed on your life, but when God uses his incomparable, exceeding, surpassing power, there is nothing the enemy can do to stop you. It is unstoppable power, and that power is available to me, and it's available to you. Now, but he doesn't stop. He says it is incomparable, uh, exceeding, surpassing power, which means when you look at your life, God has the ability, no matter what the measure, measuring rod or measuring lines are, he can take you further than your mind is able to think. Can I go a little deeper? Now, now it, it, it means at any point in your life, when God chooses, he can get a report and decide to put his power on it. Now, now, it is incomparable power. Now, now, I heard some testimonies last week of some members of this church who were diagnosed with cancer. And the enemy, the doctor, I mean the doctor, they <laughs> put a parameter on the life expectancy of this individual. This individual took the doctor's report, went home in their war room, got in the closet, lifted the report to Jesus, only to go back to the doctor, have them do some exams and determine, ma'am, I don't know where the cancer has gone, but it looks like some incomparable surpassing power has touched your life. Is there anybody in this house this morning with a testimony that when death came, God blessed you and extended your life, not because you were so good, but because it's incomparable power. Nobody can stop what God is doing in your life. Don't you dare put parameters around your life when you got the power of God because God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you ask or think. Do I got at least two witnesses in here that things didn't look like the way you wanted them to? But when God put his hand of favor upon your career, then you started moving to heights that man never knew because God's incomparable power has blessed your life. Anybody in here today that when you look where you used to be, you look where you used to go, and you look where God has you now, you got to put the God factor in there because you know you're where you are right now because God's incomparable wisdom and power has pushed you through some of the darkest moments in your life. You had to cry, but his power showed up. You had to rock in the bed to sleep, but his power showed up. You had to try to hold on to your mind, but his power showed up. Is there anybody in here that can testify, when I was weak, his power kicked in. When I didn't know what to do, his power kicked in. When depression came, his power kicked in. When anxiety came, his power kicked in. Is there at least two or three praisers that can help me praise God because his power is unstoppable. Unstoppable power. But, but watch this, watch this. It's not just incomparable, it is dunamis duname. I'm a preach, go take a nap. Lord have mercy. It is dunamis, watch this. What, you need to know, but look, this is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. 
And this is the power that's available to us. Now, this, it's, it's dunamis because watch, it is mighty, powerful strength or force. Are you with me? Now, it, it is, it's the word in the original language used for power. But it's not just dunamis, it's duname. Why? Because this type of power is able. Now, it doesn't matter if you have power that you can't use. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter if you have power and you still lose. Now, this type of power is a power that means it has the ability. In fact, it, it is a power that says God can. But, but it, it is a power that is able. Somebody say able. able. All right. Now, this is the type of power that God says raised Jesus from the dead. Why? Because this kind of power, uh, there's no multiple choice. There, there, there is no uh, select A or B. There, there is no C, all of the above. No, this type of power means when God shows up, whatever the situation is, it's got to bow down to God's mighty power. That's why we say he's able. Now, that same power is the power that is unstoppable. That when Jesus was beaten, humiliated, and died and was in a tomb, that is the unstoppable power that lifted and raised Jesus from the dead. Are you with me? Now, God's unstoppable power is not just unstoppable, it is available <laughs> to those of us who believe. Now, you don't believe me? Let's go back to Ephesians. Now, Ephesians uh, verse 19 says this. Verse 119 says, and his incomparable power, watch this, for those of us who believe. Now, we got some criterion. Help me out. This <laughs> power is available to those who believe. All right. Now, let's see, let, let's see what kind of power, where does this power go? What's up with this power? Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says this. And the spirit, uh-oh, of him who, here we go again, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Rewind the tape. Hold on. Hold on. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also will give your mortal bodies life. So, so two things we learned about this power. One, it's available to those who believe. Now, this power, the word of God says, it is the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that lives in the believer. Are you with me? Now, John chapter 14 reveals to us the significance of this power. Now you go to John chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to land at verse 16, 17, then I'm going to go down to 26, but I'm going to give you the context. Now, in John chapter 14, Jesus reveals to his disciples, before they get to chapter 20, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. That's, that's JP's translation. When he, sit, when, when he reveals to the disciples, he's going to leave them, they're troubled. They're, they're confused. They, they, they don't, he says, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, my father's mansion has many rooms. Then he says, but I, when I leave you, I will not leave you as orphans. Right? So he, the context is, Jesus has already told him, one, destroy this temple, I'm going to rebuild it in two days. Destroy this body, I will get up again. But he promises them, I'm not going to leave you alone. Don't be troubled. Because what I'm about to give you is unstoppable. Let's see. Verse 16 says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you, watch this, another advocate to help you, watch this now, and be with you forever. Who is this? The spirit of truth. Go down to verse 26. Verse 26 says this. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father, watch this, will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you everything that I said to you. Are you with me? Now, God says that there is a power that's available to you that raised Jesus from the dead. Then he reveals to us this power lives or dwells in you, in us. Now, the word of God reveals that this word in the NIV is called the advocate. You got it? You got it? The advocate. Some of you may have another translation. The ESV says the helper, right? The helper. Uh, uh, King James says the, the, uh, the comforter. You with me? Now, this, this word uh, that is used is the word we get paraclete from, all right? Paracletos, all right, is the word that it is used. Paracletos is the word that means that is paraclete, but this word reveals that it is the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? This is the power that was exerted that raised Jesus from the dead. And this power is unstoppable. Are you with me? Now, this, this, this uh, paraclete does this, right? Paraclete, Holy Spirit, on our journey, will come alongside you. When, when we go to do the things that God has called us to do, Jesus said, when I get up, I will give you the same power that raised me from the dead, and this power will walk alongside you. Not only will this power walk alongside you, it will console you. It will, the comforter, it will encourage you. The Holy Spirit, he will encourage you. He will mediate on our behalf. Are you with me? Now, this type of power, the word of God says, is called the paraclete. Now, you, you, you may not know uh, paraclete, but you might know parachute. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Now, you need a parachute to help aid an object or a person to land safely. Parachute. You need a parachute to help an object land safely. Are you with me? Now, you may not know parachute. Maybe y'all know paramedic. Now, if your health is in trouble, you need not a parachute. You need a paramedic to aid, watch this now, a patient or person in an emergency. Now, God, God listen. You, when, you are, when you want an object to land safely out of a plane, you need a parachute. When, when someone needs help in an emergency health situation, you need a paramedic. So you may not know parachute. Y'all looking at me crazy. You may not know paramedic. Well, maybe you know paralegal. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Now, if you ever find yourself in legal trouble, you will praise God for a paralegal. A paralegal will help aid an attorney to help you win your case. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, the problem is, when I'm walking in this life of faith, trying to do what God has called me to do, trying to move in the will of God, trying to overcome the obstacles of the enemy, trying to overcome despair, trying to overcome anxiety, trying to overcome depression, trying to overcome the strongholds that have been built in my mind. I don't need a parachute. I don't need a paramedic. And I sure don't need a paralegal. And God loves me so much, and God loves you so much, that God will send you a paraclete, the power of the Holy Spirit, to help you on your journey when you're doing the things that God has called you to do. And I came to encourage somebody this morning that as you move to do the things that God's called you to do, please know that God has unstoppable power that is available to you if you will trust him to do what only he can do that is heal, that is save, and that is deliver. And God says that this power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Let me see if I can help you. God, God said that the power that's available to believers is the same power that rolled away a stone. The same power that stepped into a borrowed tomb. The same, the same power that looked at death and slapped its thing. 
The same power that raised the body of Jesus from the dead so that he could have victory so that you and I could have eternal life. And that same power, somebody say same power, is available to everyone who believes so that you can get up when the enemy comes for you. Is there anybody in here that in moments of your life where you were down, it was the power of God that picked you up? Paul says, it, when I'm weak, I'm made strong because the power of God is made perfect in my weakness. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to send you the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And this power, listen to me, is able. He's able. This power is the power that God has given you, that God has given us to help us on our journey. He didn't die and get up for you to sit on the sidelines. He didn't die and get up so you can live in defeat. He didn't die and get up so that we can live in failure. No, he died and he got up so that we would have an understanding of the unstoppable power that lives in us.